Ready to start your ESG journey? Get going today with Social Suite, and you could start reporting publicly in 30 days. With investor pressure mounting and regulations just around the corner, there's never been a better time to start your ESG reporting. Social Suite takes the complexity out of environmental, social, and governance reporting. Social Suite helps organizations to measure, monitor, and report on their progress with fast, simple, and affordable software. Create value through ESG in order to raise capital, improve brand and reputation, as well as mitigate risk. Social Suite has helped almost 100 micro to small cap companies report on ESG, with some starting their baseline report in under 60 minutes and reporting publicly within 30 days. ESG is a lot easier than you think, and you're probably already doing it. So take your sustainability reporting to the next level with measurable progress. Start your ESG journey today with Social Suite, an ESG software company for micro to small caps. Visit socialsuitehq.com. That's social, S-U-I-T-E-H-Q.com to learn more. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Joe Ramelli, Vice President of Business Development for Origin Agritech. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is S-E-E-D on NASDAQ. Origin Agritech Limited, founded in 1997 and headquartered in the Zhang Guan Sun ZGC Life Science Park in Beijing, is a Chinese agricultural technology company. In crop seed biotechnologies, Origin Agritech's Phytase Corn was the first transgenic corn to receive the biosafety certificate from China's Ministry of Agriculture, according to the company's website. Three things to get you ready for this interview. One, I've been wanting to have a US-listed Chinese company on the podcast. US-listed Chinese companies have had a negative perception for a while now in general, and especially amongst US microcap investors. Out of curiosity, I wanted to chat with a US-listed Chinese company to better understand how they feel about this and approach investors with a certain narrative without knowing anything specific about their company. Two, I wanted to interview a US-listed Chinese company that I know has been around for a while and has some following from other US-based investors that I respect. And for compliance purposes, this is not an endorsement of the company itself. Origin Agritech has had a long, volatile history since going public in 2006 and have been making headlines recently after receiving GMO approval in China for their corn seed. Three, if you've been listening to this series for a while, you know I usually only interview C-Suite for this podcast. However, in Origin Agritech's case and most other US-listed Chinese companies, English is management's second language. Also, I've known Joe for a long time as an investor, and he's been an investor in Origin Agritech since 2008 and has recently been brought on as VP Business Development for the company. There's a lot to unpack with the Origin Agritech story, and in this interview, we cover all of these topics and more. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Joe Romelli, Vice President of Business Development for Origin Agritech. Joe, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm I'm good, Robert. Thanks for having me on and having an interest in the company. Absolutely, no, it's great to have you on. I, I've known the company for a long time. I, I sound like a broken record every time I do this, but like I've known Origin Agritech for a very long time. I know some investors that I've talked about in various newsletters and whatnot. So you know, for me, I was just I wanted to learn more. I wanted to get the the full picture. And by the way, just to kind of give a little preface, you know. We usually have CEO, you know, C-suite management on here for the due diligence series. But as you got, as you'll hear, you know, Origin Agritech is based in China. Management team is all Chinese. Uh, English is their second language. And uh, Joe has recently now been made a vice president of business development. He handles, uh, you know, interviews like this, most of the investor relations work as well for the company. But he's not just, you know, the IR guy. He's known the business and uh, as an investor, been a part of it since 2009. So, you know, the story very well. So with all that, all that preface, all that background information, Joe, (laughs) 
Can you start us off with that? What, what, what would you say is that one line that best describes origin agritech? Oh, one line. Boy, that's a tough one. Well, um, I, th- I think uh, the company is really leading an agricultural revolution in, in uh, modernization in China. Um, and I think that's the, you know, if I had to just rely on one line, although it's, it's much obviously much deeper than that. And uh, I think we'll get into that in, in this interview. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's China is really trailed the U.S. in, um, for example, I presented at LV Microconference last week, and in my presentation, I mentioned that China actually has more corn. So we're an agri- agri-tech company um, involved in GMO traits and uh, also um, uh, corn breeding, which, um, and uh, China actually has obviously 10% of the world's arable land and 22 percent of the world's population so it's a tough mismatch and they've actually got more corn planted there than the u.s but yields are 45 percent lower um per per acreage so obviously they've got a lot of of room to improve that and a lot of that is because they're just now they have just now flipped the switch to approve gmo traits which is one of the assets that we have that's a huge example so i know that was giving you uh 20 lines to uh to answer your question, no, about Joe, I, I, I threw I threw it at you with that first question. You know, as a, it's uh, it's what I do on every single one. So, but we're okay. we're now okay. we're now going to dig in a bit further. Like I said at the top, you've um, yeah. been involved with the company since two thousand nine. So, I'd love to look take a look back at Origin Agritech's history. When was the company officially founded, and what would you say was the original thesis for that founding? And, and Maybe, I mean, it kind of talked about how it's changed a little bit, but maybe how it's even changed over time. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the the chairman and CEO uh, now was the founder, Dr. Gang Sheng Han, and he was involved in the early days of GMO research. He got his PhD in the U.S. and he worked uh, in in the lab in in, uh, uh, GMO research for Pioneer. And he actually, uh, you know, was involved in a lot of the early uh, discovery work on on GMO traits before they were approved. Before, um, you know, I think Monsanto got the first seed trait approved in 2003. Um, and so he was one of the, the pioneers in the field. And in 98, he decided to go back to China and had an idea to create somewhat of a, of a of, a, of a, a Monsanto type of company there and, and, and bring his knowledge um, from, from working in the U S um, there. And so, uh, you know, in, in the early days, it's interesting because as I mentioned earlier, uh, he got involved in, in um, corn breeding, creating hybrid corn. And, and it takes a lot of years to create superior corn hybrids. And he was he was very interested in GMO, but at the time there was it wasn't approved yet. It was very uncertain as to when the GMO traits for, for corn would be approved in China. So what he did was got into the hybrid corn breeding, which you need those hybrid great hybrids to put the GMO traits on. So it's not like it was two unrelated businesses. So he got involved with that, and in the early days. Even though China took an extra 20 years to get GMO approved, they actually had some world-class um, research going on through academic institutes. And so the company early on collaborated um, on GMO research. And, um, and I think it's really, at the time, there was no real um, economic value to the research coming out. So the company was able to, to, co- to, to collaborate on that with the academic institutes and to leverage their resources because geez, to get one GMO trait developed can take, you know, 15 years and, and 40, $50 million, which is way too big of a hurdle for a, a tiny company that's just starting out. And, and, and so, you know, the company was really doing cutting edge research with these academic institutes and also developing this drive and hybrid corn for all the different re- regions in, in China. And so the company went public before the big boom. Um, and by the way, my old fund had a real specialty in uh, investing in Chinese stocks, uh, EOS, EOS Holdings. Uh, and John Carnes has kind of was a legend in that space, both on 
and kind of, you know, finding interesting companies initially and also in helping to expose some of, some of the, uh, some of the egregious uh, uh, or bad actors uh, in the space. So as you mentioned earlier, I've known the company since 2008. Uh, company went public in, in 2006 um, and they had commercial operations and it grew to quite uh, a large uh, uh, revenue base um, uh, it, just on hybrid corn seed. Um, so, um, you know, fast forward to now and we've, uh, we've um, kind of come full circle. So uh, in February, GMO traits, GM, GMO was, was uh, approved by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture for the first time. And so now we've, you know, in the first six months, which ended, ended in March, we did about $9 million in sales off of our legacy hybrid corn seed business, which, I, as I said, will be a part of this new, you know, it's, it's a definitely a big piece of the, uh, of the, of the new market opportunities. Um, but so um, from an investor standpoint, it's, it's a multi, you know, $8 million market opportunity. Um, uh, GMO seeds, just like what Monsanto, now part of Bayer, uh, made so much money for investors off of. We've got a similar size opportunity now in China, and there are only four uh, companies with GMO seed traits, us being one. So it's in a lot of ways, it's it's it really. I, I told I tell people uh, that it's kind of like being able to take a time machine back and invest in in Monsanto right around the time they went public. I think they went public at, in uh, 2002. Um, but instead of a um, uh, uh, 30 billion dollar market cap when, or I'm sorry, three billion dollar market cap when they went public, we're only at 30 million dollar market cap. And and also finishing that analogy with Monsanto. There were four companies with C traits in the U.S. as well, just like in China. So similar size opportunity, and and uh, that's just you know to say that the growth opportunity is just now opening. This multi-billion-dollar opportunity is just now opening up for us. Um, so that's a little bit of a historical perspective for you. Robert. Absolutely. And thank you for all of that. There are so many different rabbit holes to go down, but yeah, let's, yeah. let's start with this, you know, um, because I, it's clearly a moat for the company is the fact that you finally got that GMO certification. Am I saying that correctly? Is it, was that GMO it, approval or people have been referring approval. to it as GMO positive, the kind of GMO, po GMO positive. Okay. Yeah. Can you, can you speak a little bit more to how difficult it is to get that GMO approval positive, you know, as as a company developing, you know, seeds for human cons or for seeds for food for human consumption. Yeah, so it was um, well for the government to uh, finally approve that. You know, there's there's always around the world. There's always been some skepticism about GMO, um, and and China had it's another had thing I wanted to get into. It's share right, so. Um, um, it took, it took longer. Um, they really had some, some, some people that didn't want to see it happen. And, you know, it's interesting because really, if you look at GMO, there's, I think it's, and I, uh, Hey, people that think that, that Monsanto is, is evil or, or, you know, really would never have anything to do with GMO. I understand that. And I'm not trying to win any people over or win, win an argument on that front. But if you look at GMO technology, it's actually quite, quite a good, um, you know, like um, good for the climate. And uh, for instance, one of one of the big seed traits that that we have, um, well, we have two different ones. So we're the first company in the world that 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 will commercialize now um, a triple stack trait. So it has um, herbicide resistance and two separate um, insect traits, um, Monsanto and. And DuPont only have uh, one insect resistant trait, um, so it's it's really it was it, it, for 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 China to, to finally make that move was 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 a huge step. And as I said earlier, it, it really is is a reason why a big part of the reason and one of the only levers they could pull to increase that yield that was so much lower than um, than the U.S. was. Um, but getting back to your point, for for us as a company. Yeah, it's it's a huge huge hurdle to to develop those traits, 
And that's one of the reasons we collaborated with some of the academic institutes. And also, I, I think I neglected to mention that if, if the opportunity were open to uh, Bayer now, the old Monsanto group, to come in to, to China and to, to be the 800-pound gorilla and to market their GMO seeds here, I don't think, you know, I don't think I would be with the company. Um, they did something very similar to what they've done in pharmaceuticals, which is they reserve the opportunity for only domestic players. So that's a very important piece of the puzzle, because I think sometimes people say, you know, maybe they hear just the start of the story. It's GMO corn seeds in China. They, they think, well, hey, bears already out there, you know. Um, and, or, you know, that, that was kind of a, a story from, from quite a few years back. Uh, and they really miss the uh, why this is such a huge opportunity. So it's, it's a, you know, $8 billion market that's reserved only for domestic players. And, but to your point, it, it was, it's a very time consuming process. You know, it can take 10, 15 years to develop a, a GMO trait and it can take uh, tens of millions of dollars. It, it will take. So, uh, we are, we, and, and, you know, to give you an example, we have filed for approval for, and we're the, the first, and I think, you know, maybe the only one in China right now, but definitely the first by a long shot that has a drought resistant corn tree, which we filed for approval. We're, we're hopeful to maybe hear some, something soon without saying too much. Um, you know, I don't like to, to, to obviously comment on what the, the Ministry of Agriculture will do. Um, but, um, and if you look at that trait, going back to how GMO and ag tech can be really environmentally friendly and, you know, I've gotten calls from, um, ESG funds recently wanting to know more about it because they're looking at climate ri risk mitigation plays. And last year, China had some crazy high temperatures and, and drought. So, um, the government is obviously very excited about anything that can help to mitigate that risk. Cause you can imagine if there's a crazy drought and 30% of the, the uh, corn crop uh, doesn't survive. That's a, that's a huge risk to the, to the country, um, especially a country that, that has to in, import um, a lot of their grains from, from, from outside the, uh, the country. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a interesting bit. So, and, and then, um, yeah, so developing those different traits is, is a very complicated process. And one, one other thing I, I, I failed to mention earlier when I was saying that it's a, a green process, when you think about our two insect-resistant traits, um, without GMO, farmers are having to spray pesticides on the fields. With our triple stack, we're, which we're, is the country's um, crown jewel, and we're the only one that has that, uh, that trait, um, and we've got a several-year head start on anybody else. Um, and it's resistant. It, it basically trains the corn to um, expel a certain protein. And if you think about it with, um, with corn, um, the, the corn uh, expels a protein that's toxic to insects, but that you and I will get in our food sources, in our food from, uh, from other sources every day. So for it's super, super uh, safe, um, but 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 for um, but but in a bigger picture, the actual um, it's it's a very green solution rather than spraying pesticides and having it get in the groundwater. So I think it's really un understated uh, a quality that actually GMO can be very environmentally friendly. For sure, and. I I mean, look, we'll we'll leave that for 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 the environmentalists, some of the ESG yeah, funds debate, yeah. right? Like, I, I I don't have that uh, knowledge base to 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 critique that, but but I but I want one more follow up question on the on the GMO trade and getting that is this a global trait or global uh, GMO? I know I say certification, not that's not the right term, but for lack of a better way of saying it. Like it is, or is this just in China that it's the like you got the GMO trait stamp of approval? We got it only in 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 China. Um, okay. And, and as I said, that second insect resistant trait, other people are looking at it, and I've actually had people reach out to me on the business development side about that trait. Um, so yeah, and and you know if you look at the opportunity, 
by far the low hanging fruit right now is China. Um, it's just such a huge, it's a nascent opportunity. It's just opening up. So, um, you know, there are opportunities. We did license some of our technology uh, to pioneer. Um, now it's changed names, but um, uh, like five or six years ago for use outside of, of China. But for right now, you know, the opportunity uh, is so huge and, and really going outside the U S and getting approval for things and then competing against, like I mentioned earlier, the 800 pound gorilla um, is not really uh, a good use of our resources as, as a small company. For sure. Current, it, currently, it, I should right. say. Yeah. For sure. So Joe, uh, bear with me when I ask this question, but you know, but you know, the, how, you know, uh, U S listed Chinese companies, have that impression in the U.S. You you're very well aware of it. You you worked at a fund that specialized in looking at this. So mm-hmm. let's let's take a step back and think about it from that perspective of like, all right, Origin Agritech. You have the this GMO trait approval specifically only in China. What's we? I think maybe this again. This might be my own ignorance, but we know how sometimes things work in China, where like if you know somebody in the government, you, there's that system in place, you know. So what's stopping, you know, Origin Agritech Two from coming in and saying, "Hey, you know, we have this technology that's somewhat similar," and them just stepping over you because of they have a better relationship higher up in government, right? Like, is that some is that a risk factor that folks should? think about or or am i off you tell me i'm just you know how it no, is no i don't i don't think so i think um dr han is one of the godfathers of the uh, uh the ogs of the kind of uh he's very well respected he's he's asked to appear on panels all the time he's very good standing with with uh with the ministry of agriculture which is the governing body and there's I think a lot of things have have really they've done a lot to really um for example um uh with 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 some of the what was the train of thought I was on there um they they've really have a very official process you've got to go through and there's no shortcuts there's a long you've got to go out and do field trials you've got to do animal studies you've get you've got to, to see the impact of the GMO trade on animals there's there's a very official process, almost like getting an, a, a drug through uh, the FDA uh, for approval. And I would say they take it every bit as seriously. And, you know, some of the other fronts, the government, I mean, seven or eight years ago or 10 years ago, there was there was a big problem with people kind of uh, uh, taking other people's seeds and 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 and, and stealing their uh, their IP. So uh, four or five years ago. The government realized that, hey, if we want people to invest in this field, we need to modernize our agriculture. We need to get our yields up to where the U.S. is to feed our people. Is Because I said, you know, the mismatch of 10 percent of the arable land and 22 percent of the, the world's population is is quite a huge, uh, huge, huge mismatch. So they looked at it and they said, we've got to really have um, an IP framework that we in, we inf- we enforce people's ownership and we so you know not just on the approval process it's it's every bit as as impressive as as regulation of of uh, the drug industry is in the US i would say so i i'm not concerned at all about that and and we're in you know and i think you have some potential to hear about some really exciting things um on on coming out of our work with with the government sometime soon uh, um so yeah stay tuned for sure no I, and i appreciate you answering that question but you probably i mean look you've done the dog and pony show for a long time now right like you know that that's always something that's of concern that people are going to ask well there them. are con- there are concerns and and you know i think i think hey as it, going back i've known the company since 08 yeah. Um, and, and some of the things like I'm, I'm organizing an R&D virtual event where people will be able to go to our R&D headquarters. I mean, I've done this uh, several times and, and, you know, be able to see all the scientists working on creating. New, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, to talk to our, our head of R&D and, and to see our Beijing facility. It's in Beijing and the place is huge. I mean, it's on the it's on the suburbs, but it would be so hard to replicate. Not 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 really the building, but 
just the open space, you're like, this is Beijing. Um, so we've got big planting fields and just to be able to go out there, because I feel like, you know, we're one removed, as you mentioned, not only just it's the other side of the world and language. Um, so to give people a chance to kind of reach out and touch and feel and ask questions, I think is going to be a great thing to, uh, to let people see, you know, how, how, how impressive everything we're working on is. Absolutely. So let's talk about the tech a little bit more, you know, cause right now, obviously it's, you know, you guys are focused on, on, uh, corn seeds. Um, I mean, that's where you have the GMO approval and, uh, yeah. right now, but does the technology lend itself to other for other crops? Yeah. So we do have, we do have, um, uh, GMO traits and some breeding capabilities on soybean. It's not, you know, it's definitely there. It's something we work on. It's not, not something that I would say is anywhere near as big of a market. I think the biggest application of our, some different technology is also, is also on, on corn. And it's something that we haven't gone into yet. And, you know, when I joined the company, I've, I've been on top of things, but they had kind of a stealth development going on with a, a new corn variety, which is an even bigger opportunity than the GMO opportunity. And that's that we developed a type of corn that hogs can thrive on without um, any additives. So typically 90 whatever percent of the, of the corn grown in China goes for feedstock um, to, corn, to hogs and, you know, Pork is by far the preferred protein in China. It's a huge, huge, you know, with a growing middle class, people are consuming more meat. And so there's, uh, that's where it ends up. Currently, um, uh, every, every uh, corn that sells for feedstock, so the feedstock companies have to you know, process, uh, buy the corn on contracts from, from farmers. Then they've got to add soybean meal, typically is how it's done universally in China to add um, protein oil and amino acids to the corn to make it so that the hogs can can thrive off of just corn. Otherwise they would be skinny, malnourished, might even die. So we've developed, and we're the only one in the world that have this, a corn that hogs can thrive off of without the soybean the sub- supplementation, which may not sound like a lot, but if you look at the economics of it, you have corn that in China is about four hundred dollars a metric ton. They have to add fifty dollars worth, roughly worth of soybean meal to make it so that hogs can can thrive off of this. And and for a feedstock company that's dealing in mass, I mean, the, the feedstock market is a seventy five billion corn feedstock, seventy five billion dollar market. Um, so they have to, and they're operating on huge margins and tiny, like four or five percent gross margins. Um, which is fine, you know, because it's it's just a massive, massive market. Um, but so we're able to sell, s- save them fit that $50 in, in added cost, which can essentially double their profit margins. So it's 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 something that just is launching right now. We were we we are just we just signed our first uh, contract uh, planting um, for uh, that we announced like a. Uh, four or five weeks ago um, for something that about $8 million worth of corn were growing to supply to the first. Um, and we, when we, when we sent, uh, when we said this to the feedstock companies and sometimes directly to bigger hog farmers going directly to them, like Muyong, the, the biggest, they didn't believe us. We had to send samples and they independ- independently um, had labs verify that it was nutritionally sufficient. So really the only limiting impact or a limiting uh, factor here is that we just now are growing it. Everybody, everybody that we've talked to wants it and wants a lot of it. And it's kind of one of those things where how could you, if your competitors start using, first of all, why wouldn't you want to drop double your profit margins? It, it's, it sounds like kind of crazy to say that you can do this for such a massive industry. Um, so taking that, what we did was, I think it was a really brilliant idea that we had was that we could, okay, so since we found the goose that laid the golden egg, we could just kind of sell that goose. In other words, do our traditional business where we're selling corn seeds. It's about 5% of the finished selling price. So we could do that. The challenge really is with that, um, 
that um, were given this to the feedstock companies or to through selling through distributors. And then they get to charge like a higher price because of how impactful it is. So what we did was we said, Hey, we want to control more of this. So what we're, what we, the decision we made was we're going to go in and we're going to um, contract grow this corn. And so instead of getting 5%, we're getting a hundred percent. So instead of an $8 billion market cap uh, market opportunity, we're going in, into a seven, 75 billion and growing the contract corn. And so since we're a small company and we don't have a ton of capital uh, and, you know, sometimes you're growing fast, you need more capital. What we've done is uh, I'll give you an example on this $8 million we're growing and the corn's already, you know, been planted like uh, six weeks ago and is, is getting quite large. So what we did was we went to uh, Xinjiang and we, we, um, we partnered up with a la- local agriculture company. And the deal that was that we're majority owners, which is interesting because we, we consolidate that on our financials, obviously, too. Um, they're 49% owners. What they bring to the table is we, we bring the corn seeds and the technology. Um, what, the, what our partner brings is the land, which people don't own land in China. It's all leased. So getting access to that land, especially to get started, is, is, is a is a, a challenging undertaking and they also contribute capital and they bring uh, their connections to finance with the banks um, and one other. Um, and so they're supplying all the capital needed to grow. A couple other interesting areas is that um, China has a really reasonable crop insurance. So, you know, people think on farming is risky. We're, we're covered on, on the, on the risk aspect. And, and the last thing I'll say on that front is, not only so we didn't even walk away from the seed business we're still selling the the seed for that business to the jv so we're still capturing a hundred percent but even brilliantly i think traditionally we've gone through distributors which take a cut now we're selling directly so it's almost like we even you know we didn't just give up that opportunity on the seed business for the five percent we're capturing you know, 110 or 120 percent of that business because we're not relying on distributors that are taking a cut. So it's 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 a so you know it's interesting if you take a step back a 30 million dollar market cap company that just has two nascent multi billion dollar opportunities and they're not totally independent. So we already have those GMO trades stacked on to the to the NEC corn. So it's 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 related, you know, it's not, it's not like two totally separate products, but it's, it's, a, it's two massive opportunities. So that's a good example of how we're, we're, we're taking the technology and moving in different ways. Well, let me ask this. Cause like you said, you know, the, uh, you've been, I guess I got to correct myself, you know, earlier in the interview, I said you've been in this since 2009, but you, you've corrected it and said since 2008, you know, and you said back, you know, early on in origins history that there was some, you know, revenue opportunities there, but you know now we're kind of hearing more about some of the demo. So like, help help me help me kind of put the puzzle piece together a little bit more because, you know, look, the stock has kind of gone through some some volatility, I guess to say the least. Yeah, right? yeah, you know, no doubt, no doubt. Keep it keep it like that, right? Um, since since it uh, it originally went public in two thousand six. Um, so help me understand it better. Was this really you know? For those that weren't following, was this really more of a, a tech IP play? And now we're finally seeing the commercialization, or was there like a little bit of commercialization? But now, like with the GMO approval, like you're you're ramping up. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, and I think there's a couple aspects to that. Um, so early on, um, we did have kind of a hot, thriving hybrid seed business, and as I had mentioned, there were some challenges um, with IP. And so candidly, we had grown to, I forget what the number was, but early on, like several, several years after the IPO, we'd grown to several hundred million US dollars in revenue. And it was like the wild west. I mean, people were stealing our hybrids and claiming them as, as their own or, or selling them under their own name. Um, so there, there were some challenges early on. And then it's the second aspect to that is that, um, yeah, we've been waiting for uh, for um, waiting for GMO, and and I think there was, gosh, what was it? Two thousand. Don't quote me on this, but 
well, obviously you're quoting me on this, but um, 2010, 2011, we got the country's first biosafety certificate, which is a gating event for, for a GMO trade. And our stock went up 300% in a few days on that news. And I think the conventional wisdom, though, is that GMO was going to be approved um, you know, within a year or two, and, and it just kind of kept getting dragged out. And the, com- the country and the Ministry of Agriculture took a really – a really conservative stance um, and, and took, you know, 10 years longer than I think anybody really anticipated. So yeah, it, it's really those two aspects. The hybrid business was hard to defend and, and, and got, you know, um, got very challenging, but, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that all that, all that effort that went into the hybrid business, by the way, now we have, like I said, all of our IP is protected. All of our hybrids are protected. There's no chance of that ever happening again. And one of the interesting things, and so we have four, uh, three competitors um, on the GMO front. We have Divanon Technology Group, which there's a couple of interesting things that I wasn't thinking, thinking of, but I'll throw in here. About a year ago, they spun off their GMO. So they're kind of, all these three of these companies are bigger companies. So, which I think is interesting because it's always hard for a big company to, to innovate and to keep, you know, focused on such a, such a, on, on such a narrow, narrow area. So um, Divanong spun off and raised money at a 700 million, I think it was 700 million post, but it was only they raised a hundred million dollars uh, post money, US dollars. Um, just for the GMO seed traits. And what they have is old seed traits that are Monsanto off patent traits that they filed for approval. So we've got, you know, like the drought resistant. I think we have premium traits to what they have. Obviously, they're working on next generation ones. So that's a good, good comparable. I mean, we're sitting here with a $30 million market cap. Um, then we have Long Ping, um, that's also a, a big player in the rice, rice field. Pretty innovative company. They actually tried to buy us five, six years ago when nobody, there was no certainty around GMO for a hundred million US. Um, and uh, and then the third company is Syngenta, which used to be a Swiss company that was acquired by a Chinese state-owned enterprise, which is kind of another catalyst. They're preparing for a, a huge, one of the biggest IPOs ever on the Chinese uh, uh, big board. So uh, uh, a couple of interesting things there. Yeah, but finishing off what, what what happened with the share price, which I think is really interesting right now. I think there were some traders in it, the stock that thought that we were going to get GMO approval and we're in it for that um, that catalyst. There was a lot of rumblings in China that was finally going to happen. And so actually, you know, sell the news and the stock didn't go up on that. So we've dropped from where we were up close to 10 all the way down to uh, to five dollars currently. And And if you look at this opportunity, um, you know, for a $30 million market cap with everything going on. It's, and you know, and it's not like we don't have revenue. I think we reported in the last six months, and you, as I mentioned earlier, nine, 9 million US dollars, which was up 40% over last year, just on our legacy business. So, um, you know, it's a, I think it's a pretty low risk opportunity. Uh, I, I think it's a very low risk opportunity, which, which has the potential. If you start doing the numbers, and even say we don't get one quarter of the market, which I think we have a possibility of on the GMO front, say we get half of that, you know, and you start throwing those numbers in for the size of the GMO market. And then you say, we, hey, we don't take a quarter of the $75 billion. Say we take 5% of that and you put those in a spreadsheet and you start playing around with them. I mean, you get to a pretty insane stock price um, pretty easily with pretty conservative uh, or overly conservative assumptions, I think. So, Joe, I mean, you know, you kind of alluded to my next question a little bit here. You know, Mm -hmm. you were just, like I said, you've done the dog and pony show. You were just at L. We're recording this on uh, Wednesday, June 14th, uh, 2023. You were just at LD last week. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing some of the, you know, the one-on-one meetings, you know, you're doing the investor presentation, all that kind of stuff. What would you say are still some of the more frequently asked questions that you get? or, Or what do investors still get confused about when thinking of origin agritech and trying to paint the full picture? Maybe we can address some of those questions here. Yeah, I I think I think I think after going through what I try to do in in one on one meetings is really 
kind of give people not as, as as long obviously as we've gone through because generally they're, they're they're 30 minutes i was gonna say like a half hour like <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I like to say uh let's go over the view from thirty thousand feet to keep a lot of room for questions and i think a lot of a lot of the once they understand the opportunity i think they're they're excited by it you know i think that the people do have candidly some kind of you know concerns about investing in china you know there there was back in 2010 11 12 13 after the big wave came here there was there was a lot of lot of uh bad actors that and i i really think that i'll you know we have a, a lot of that shaken out of the industry and so the companies that we have in china not just origin but i think some of the, the companies out there right now are, are, are a lot, are pretty high caliber companies, you know? And so, so yeah, I think that they've got to get comfortable around the, the China angle of it. And they have more questions about, you know, a, a Chinese company. And I tell people, Hey, listen, there's always a reason why a company, you know, an, an opportunity exists. It's like if everybody believes that in what we have and, and everybody would play in China um, we wouldn't be trading at $30 million. We'd probably be trading 3 billion, like when, when Monsanto IPO right now, um, you know, because that was before they really had GMO revenue too. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge for some people. And I think that's why the opportunity exists to get into something for such a cheap, cheap, uh, cheap, um, cheap valuation. Um, so yeah, some of the other questions, just trying to understand people don't really understand we've got great technology we're one of the fastest uh we can do um gene editing which is something we haven't talked about which is really speeding up um, corn breeding um and people don't really understand about what's gmo well well gmo is interesting it's like taking uh, some genes from another plant or an animal even and putting them into corn to give the the the, the corn the ability to do things that are not in its own genome. And I think that's why people are, are sometimes a little bit skeptical of it. Um, but um, CRISPR, CRISPR is a term you've heard a lot, I'm sure, at bi interviewing biotech executives. So we can take CRISPR and we can do things that used to take 10 years. And we can do that in about half the time of that even the big players like um, that I mentioned earlier. I don't want to throw out names right now. And, uh, with this claim, but um, we can do it in about half the, it's still challenging to get past this stuff. Very, very challenging. And I've had industry players tell me that like um, before when I was an analyst, um, just how challenging it can be in um, getting past a cell wall. So we can do, we can, we, but what we can do is the old days you used to know what, what and getting back to our uh, NEC corn, you, you, you know, when we started breeding that we knew what was, what gene was responsible for upregulating protein or a couple genes. But in those days, you'd have to start from there and then selectively breed the, the corn to get that gene turned on, say, for example, or turned off in other uh, instances. So, and, and of course, breeding. So you have to go through so many different, it could take 10 years to do that. And not only that, but you would get a lot of off target to use kind of a biotech, uh, biotechnology of uh, uh, drug development, uh, term you'd get a lot of off target now we can just laser pinpoint um so you know people don't really necessarily that are generalists understand when we talk about gene editing how much of a revolution that is what the difference between gene editing and gmo is and so some of that some of it is just really if it's generalists getting them up to speed on all these different technologies without overwhelming them too you don't really want to do that 100 percent. all right so another kind of you know, devil's advocate -y type question, you know, yeah. in, your, in your opinion, what would you say then are some of the risk factors or the company's downside risks that folks should be aware of when evaluating? I mean, you know, I, I mean, at, at, at $30 million market cap, I, I, will Joe, I won't, I won't let, I won't let you say there is no risk. Okay. I think the thing I hear from, from investors, let's put it on. I'm, I'm, I've drank the Kool-Aid, right? I mean, you know, I've, 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 I've ate my own dog food or as I've heard somebody say before, you know, it's, I'm a believer. I've got, you know, I've, I'm an investor. I've taken a lot of my compensation in, in, in the form of stock too. I've got my friends and family into it. I think my parents own 9,000 shares, which is kind of a, a, a pretty 
sizable position for them too. So, you know, I'm a believer and, and, uh, but you know, some of the concerns I always hear is, okay, you guys, you guys are going to, you guys are going to, are you guys going to raise money? You know, it's like, okay, you've got $2.1 million. You're going to need capital. We're not looking to raise money. Um, I've, I've, I've mentioned that we we're, we're doing this, this, uh, contract growing, uh, through partners that are funding the growth. Um, so that's one of the big things, but what I tell people is, you know, Hey, we're not looking to raise money. We've got the money we need to execute on our plan. And also chairman Han is the biggest investor. You know, one of the things going back to my time as an analyst and, and, and sitting on that side of the table, um, which I think brings a lot to crossing over the company side. Um, interestingly, but, um, you know, I, I was always fearful of the guys that had no skin in the game because those are the ones that, that the interests are not aligned. Maybe their, their, uh, their, their salary becomes more important keeping their salary going than, than uh, actually running the company. I mean, this is not only he's the biggest investor, but it's also his life's, it's his legacy, right? You know, so he's not going to do anything stupid. And, 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 so, but that's one of the big questions we get, you know, um, I think, uh, I think I'm definitely o- able to over, overcome that objective and, or just, just explain it to people that way. Um, you know, I guess uh, other risks, you know, sm- small companies always have risks, even big ones. You know, it's uh, some of them are unforeseen. Uh, I, I don't really see any real big risks. Obviously, a big risk was always, would this happen on the GMO front? Would it ever happen? Can China, you know, so that was just overcome in, in February when they, they flipped the switch and went GMO positive. So, I mean, I'm sure there's other risks out there that I'm not hitting on. There's always, you know, the known risks and the unknown risks, but. I would say I would say a lot of it's been de-risked recently is how I believe it. So kind of kind of like the uh, the the I remember early on interviewing it's that's kind of like the question like tell me about your weaknesses <laughs> you know it's like you know of course uh, but but yeah of course I'm being candid and open and and I just don't see a lot of other risks right now. Okay, fair enough. So yeah. So my so Joe, my final question for you here today, because you've you, we've really covered quite a bit, um, mm. and I'm sure I'll have you back on do an update and all that kind of stuff. So you know, yeah. in your in your opinion, where you know, in talking with management, you know, as VP business development, the, just the whole team, what does what's the team collectively? Where do where do they want to see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are some of the inflection points that'll get the company there? Yeah. So um, I I you know. I think we've, we've stated publicly that we want to be a, a, a billion dollar uh, in sales in three to five years, which seems kind of crazy right now. Um, just given where we're coming from, but you know, I don't need to go back into the two opportunities, but, and, and, and really on the NEC corn side, we have no competition on that front and we're doubling people's profit margins. So I think that um, that's where, where we're going from a, a, a from a, a a goal of, of where we want to grow to. Um, you know, I think, I think um, the goals and objectives, I, I can tell you everybody's super excited. As I mentioned to you, I was on a, a video uh, kind of uh, um, video stream with the head of R and D recently, just kind of keep myself up to and getting some questions answered, not only on the BD front, but also on the investor front, um, just increasing my own knowledge base. So I can always talk um, as an expert on, or somewhat of an expert on the field, you know. Um, I can tell you the that the the energy and the excitement from him is is off the charts. You know, he just mentioned that everybody wants to get a hold of our NEC corn, um, and so yeah, that's everybody in the organization is super fired up and and uh, and, and thinks that there are exciting times ahead for us. Very good. All right. Well, Joe, we're there, man. Where can our audience go and find more information? on Origin Agritech to get more information? Yeah, I think obviously originagritech.com. We also um, uh, maintain a company's Twitter account. You know, we try and put some stuff out there from time to time that's not your average. I tell people, hey, if you're going to have a company's Twitter account and all you're going to do is is retweet your your company's PRs, don't even have it. So we we try and kind of, you know, obviously you don't don't want to, tweet things that are going to get yourself in trouble, but we try to, you know, do some educational stuff. And then, as I mentioned, stay tuned to the company's Twitter account. I think it's uh, origin underscore agritech. 
for some news coming out soon on that R&D day where people will be able to, to log into a live stream um, and, 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 you know, get, get exposure to that. So I think that's going to be a fun event as well. Yeah. I was literally just going through your Twitter stream a second ago. Just like, Oh yeah, this is, that's, that's some, some different stuff for sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so, some, well, you know, you have to, you're in China, what, what you got to, yeah, you got, you got to do this. You know, stuff, Robert, I'm, as like, you know, Robert, having hosted, uh, you know, having the wonderful, you know, uh, planet, planet microcap conference, uh, that you host yeah it's been a real bloodbath for for micro cap brutal and you know we had a couple of years of where we we a couple of years finally where micro caps were on fire uh and then everybody i think got kind of uh oh hey the money's going to keep flowing so i know some of my friends that run you know small cap micro cap focused funds or or that are uh, financial advisors that play in that space or stockbrokers i guess they've really been hit hard so uh, yeah i think it's in- interesting times but hey it's uh, interesting times lead to outsized uh gain opportunities you know challenging times really in my experience i'm, I'm putting out i'm putting out a pod um next well i guess we're putting this out in a couple of days so um the next week i think i mean you'll hear from an investor that you know, he's like, he feels like a kid in the candy store right now, you know? Oh, um, yeah. Micro cap investor. The challenging thing is a lot of people have, you know, come into it fully invested. So if you've got dry powder, man, it's like those were always the times when my biggest gains on the fund or personal investing side came. I know quite I know quite a few people that have a ton of dry powder right now. That's for sure. That's great. That's well, great. let's leave let's leave it there. So Joe, right. th- th- thanks again for joining me. Really do yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Robert. Appreciate it. This was Good. a lot of fun. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.